Okay, so hello and welcome to today's introduction to the examination regulations for our master's programs in mathematics. So I hope all of you are going to start your master's program in mathematics in one of our mathematics programs here. If not, this is maybe not the right course for you. Um, before we start, let me quickly mention that as you've probably guessed already, we are going to record this session for all of those who cannot attend today so that I can uh, later put that video online on our Moodle Info course, so that all those who couldn't make it today can also watch this and have all the information. I'd like to present a few more or less essential things, something that I think you should be aware of before you start your program here. Um, if at any point during this presentation you have any questions, then please don't hesitate to ask at any time. Right, so. Let's start. Let's see if this works. It doesn't. It does now. Okay. So let me start by saying welcome here at TUM. We are very happy to have you here, and we do hope that you will enjoy your time here at TUM. I'll start by introducing a few people that you will probably meet during your studies. Um, first one is Anja Hoffmann, my colleague Anja Hoffmann, who's also here today to help answer your questions. Um, my name is Michael Ritter. I'm the secretary to the examination board for the master's progress in mathematics. So that means I'm pretty much responsible for any questions that you might have connected to the examination regulations or general questions around your master's programs. You're welcome to come with these questions to me or to Anja Hoffmann, who will also be able to help you here. If you have any question that is specific to your master's program, things like what courses would you recommend in the coming semester um, that are not of such a general nature, then it's probably best to talk to your study advisors. We have at least one study advisor um, for all of our programs. And again, you're welcome to attend uh, the consultation hours or to just write them an email or drop by their office, um, see if they're available so that you can ask questions specific to that program. Those study advisors uh, are Frank Himstedt for the mathematics program. Who of you is studying the general math masters, by the way? Okay, thank you. Then we have, for those studying data science, who's studying data science? So your study advisor is uh, Peter Massepost. Um, then what about math finance and actual science? And that should cover pretty much all of the audience now. <laughs> so your study advisor is Alexei Min. Alexei is also always available to help. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it here today. You will be able to meet uh, Peter Masopus later. Alexei couldn't make it today. Uh, but he will be offering um, a specific introduction for those studying that program as well. I'll give you the details um, later on. And we also have uh, mathematics in science and engineering. That would be Raina Kallis. So who of you is studying mathematics in science and engineering? All right, thanks. Um, and finally, mathematics and operations research. Anyone studying mathematics and operations research? A few, wonderful. <laughs> so your study advisor um, is René Brandenberg. Um, I used to do that job as well, so I might also be able to help if you have any urgent questions. If for some reason you don't know who to ask, there is always the info point. The info point is located at room um, 10, 052. So that's on the ground floor um, in that direction and somewhere to the left, pretty much at the back of the building. Um, just go through that glass door and then there's the info point. Um, and in the info point, you'll probably meet one of those people here. So there's Silke Brandenberg, Anja Hoffmann, who's here today, um, Heike Kudlich and Nina Meyer. Maybe you've been in touch during your application with one of those. Um, the info point will either be able to answer your questions, help you with your questions, hopefully, or they will at least be able to point you in the right direction. So they should know whom to ask. So again, if you don't know who to address your question to, just go there. Um, they are open, I don't know, how often are you open? Just 
So almost every day. And the details are always available on the web page that I copied here, um, and that you should also be able to find on your own, hopefully. Um, so you can look up the opening hours there. And if the info point is closed and you have an urgent question, just write an email and again, we we'll try to help. And then there's our international office. So those are the people you'll get in touch with um, if you want to spend a semester abroad, or maybe if you come here to spend a semester or to do your program from a foreign country. Um, that would be Julia Zulok. She's mostly responsible for the incomings. So those of you who just came to Germany for this program, you've probably met Julia already. Um, those of you who want to spend a semester abroad are probably going to meet Carola Jumpertz. She's responsible for the outgoings. Um, so she'll help you with your application. She'll be able to point you in the right direction. She'll be able to give good advice on where to go, when to go, what the best choice for your specific ideas um, and wishes is. And then there's uh, Angela Pochert. Uh, she's mostly responsible for recognitions. So she'll be the one signing your um, Erasmus Plus learning agreement. Again, details are on the website. Um, just write an email if you want to get in touch or attend one of the information events. I'll have a few more details on that later as well. Okay, so let's start off with a few details on general program structure. Now, the structure of our programs is pretty similar for most of the programs with the exception of data science. That one is a little different and I'll point out the details in just a minute. Um, I'll start with a quick introduction to the credit point system, just in case you're not familiar with that yet. So for all of the modules, all of the courses that you can take, there is a certain number of credit points assigned to those. And those credit points are usually earned by passing the examination. Sometimes that examination consists of more than one part, um, but that is a rather rare case. So usually it's just one examination. Uh, in most cases, you don't have to attend the lecture if you don't want to. Yeah, so you can, maybe if you already did the course in an um, earlier semester, but for some reason didn't go to the exam, um, you can always register in the later semester and then do just the exam. That may of course be a little risky because the contents may change, um, but theoretically, that possibility is there. So you get the credits if you pass the exam and you don't get any credits if you don't pass the exam, obviously. Um, as a measure of thumb, one credit point is worth or is equal to about 30 hours of total workload, including attending the lectures, including attending the exercises, including, and that's probably the most part, working at home. Uh, learning for the exam and also attending the exam. So that should give you a rough idea of how much work to spend for each course in the course of a semester. About 30 hours in total throughout the semester per credit point attached. And you're expected to earn about 30 credit points per semester. Um, again, that's not a strict limit. I'll talk about strict limits later, um, but as a rough Rule of thumb, um, you should aim at doing about 30 credits per semester. Not too much below that, but also not too much above that. That's just going to be too much work then, yeah? So that means you'll have about 900 hours of work to put in per semester. Okay, and that semester workload basically corresponds um, to a 40 hour week, um, but unfortunately that's calculated on the basis of six semesters, so, sorry, six months per semester. So usually it will be a little more work during lecture time and a little less work outside of lecture time. So that in average, you'll have about 40 hours per week. Now, all the master's programs um, are usually designed for four semesters. So that means you take about 30 credits each semester. That means you'll earn a total of 120 credits for your master's program. In case you did get prerequisite courses, and I'll give you a hint of how to find that out in just a minute, um, those are on top. So prerequisite courses would not count towards your credits. 
You have to pass those courses, but you don't get any credits for those. If you have any prerequisites, you need to complete those during the first year of your study program. You usually do one seminar um, throughout your program, and most people do that in the third semester. There is no strict rule for that. You can do it whenever you want, basically. Uh, but it's usually done in the third semester, and it's usually the basis for a master's thesis. And that's why it's done at that time, because the fourth semester is usually devoted to the master's thesis, which in itself is worth 30 credits. So that's one whole semester of work. You will also do an internship and attend the internship seminar where you give a presentation um, of what you did in your internship. Most people do that internship in or between the second and third semester, uh, but again, there is no strict rule for that. You're free to do that whenever you want, uh, but you have to be finished with the internship and the internship seminar before you want to graduate, obviously. And then going abroad is also an option, of course. Um, and we're making, we actually make an effort to send you abroad. Again, most people do that during the second and or third semester, depending on your choice of courses, depending on your specific program, depending on the guest university where you want to stay. Lots of factors go into this. Um, and Carola Jumpertz will be able to help you with that choice. Um, but just as a rough guideline, most people do it in that time somewhere. So let's talk a little bit about the requirements for getting a degree. Basically, you need to earn a certain number of credits um, in certain sections. So that means uh, for certain modules. I'll first talk about the general degree requirements for all programs except for data science, and then I'll point out the differences. Um, so basically, in all of our programs, except for data science, um, you earn 77 credits in mathematical modules and in what I call minor subject modules here. Um, the name is different depending on the program, um, but usually that, that means non-mathematical modules, but applications in other fields that you can do, sometimes have to do as part of your program, um, and sometimes they're optional. So that's at least 77 credits for those. Then there's the master's thesis. I already mentioned the thesis is worth 30 credits. You do one seminar. A seminar is usually worth three credits. You do the internship and the internship seminar. That gets you six credits. And you also do interdisciplinary modules worth at least four credits. Um, and that means soft skills courses, language courses, and things like that. So there's a broad choice of modules that you can use for that. Okay, so and if you do the math uh, in total, that means 77 plus 13, that's 90, plus 30, that's 120. So that gets you your degree in the end. And depending on what program you're studying, those 77 credits uh, are then structured into different sections, and there is often specific requirements on each of the sections. Let's say uh, something like you have to earn at least nine credits out of that section and nine credits out of that section and things like that, yeah? Um, it's probably best to just look up the details in the examination regulations um, or on TUM online. So if you go to your curriculum on TUM online, most of those are also visible there. But the safest bet is always to look into the actual legal documents. Let's have a quick look at data science. Um, that's a little different. So one important part of those 77, almost 77 credits, um, in data science, um, there is two modules that you absolutely have to do. Um, in all the other degree programs, uh, basically all modules are elective modules. So no modules that are strictly have to be done. In data science, there are two modules that strictly have to be done that are mandatory. And that's the modules Foundations in Data Analysis and Foundations in Data Engineering. One is offered in the summer, one is offered in the winter, so usually you do one in the first and one in the second semester. Um, each gets you eight credits, so that's a total of 16. Um, then you take math modules and computer science modules. Again, there's a large catalog. 
um, in different sections with certain requirements on what you have to do in these sections. In total, that gets you 53 credits, at least 53 credits in math and computer science modules. Then there's also the master's thesis, again, with 30 credits. And then we have this, this green block here that consists of an internship. The internship in data science is longer. So in uh, the other programs, you do at least four weeks. In data science, you do at least six weeks. And that's why it is worth 10 credits. You also do interdisciplinary modules, but now there's two kinds of these. There is the, let's say, the, the standard interdisciplinary modules. You do at least three credits in those. And then there are some modules um, that are called social and political aspects of data science. And you do at least three credits in that section. And then there's the seminar. And again, the seminar for data science is with five credits. And that also means you have to put in more work than all the other students, right? So that's basically the difference to all the other programs. And again, if uh, I did that correctly, that should sum up to 120 credits. Okay, as for the details, as for the sections available, I already said you can have a look at Campus TUMDE, Tom Online, um, where most of those minimum credit requirements are visible, where you can see the sections and the modules that are contained in each section. Um, the app to date catalog is always on TM Online. There's also a catalog in the examination regulations, uh, but that's a legal document that cannot change as fast as modules are changing. So the up to date version is on Tom Online always. Want to know details about modules, where they belong to, what number of credits you get, um, have a look at TUM Online and you should find that information there. And you can also access the module handbook uh, with more detailed information on the modules. You can also find a, a description of the contents, um, information on the language, mostly English, but in minor, you'd also find some modules that are still done in German. Um, information on how regular those classes are given. Some are given every year, some are given on a very irregular basis, some are given on a two yearly basis, something like that. That's all contained in the module handbook. Just have a look there and you'll find the information there. And also you'll be able to register for courses there. Um, basically, registration for a course is not strictly required to earn the credits, but what it does, it usually gives you access to course materials on our learning platform on Moodle. Yeah, so you should register for a course on Tom Online, and then you'll automatically get access to everything connected to that course. Um, but it's not a strict requirement. So if you, for some reason, miss that registration, you can still attend the exam. All right, any questions so far before we go to the exams point? Yes. So the question is, is the master's thesis, has, does it have to be the last thing you do? So the answer is, uh, there is no strict requirement for that. Uh, in some of the programs, uh, there is a requirement that you need to pass a certain number of courses. If in doubt, just ask us, that applies to you. Um, but it doesn't have to be the last thing you do, yeah? So what many students actually do is um, they do the master's thesis in the fourth semester, and then they do maybe a minor course in addition to that as well. I would not recommend doing it much earlier, simply because you usually don't have the knowledge to do that. Um, so it's usually a good idea to have a thesis at the very end. Um, but if you want to take another small course in addition to that, that's usually fine. Yes. Yes. So the question is for data science with that 53 credits, is there... Um, any regulation on how to distribute those? Yes, uh, we can have a look at that later. Remind me at the end and we'll have a look at the uh, examination regulations. The details are all in there. So it's a little complicated, unfortunately.
Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the problem is uh, some of you may not yet be officially enrolled because you were not able to submit all the documents. Um, and if you're not enrolled, you don't get access to Term Online or not the access that you need to register for courses at least. Um, and that means you don't get access to Moodle. Um, now, of course, the best thing would be to enroll as fast as possible, but if that's not possible, you can always ask the lecturer of a course um, to add you to Moodle. If you do that, make sure to send uh, your TUM email address because that will be the easiest way for him to find you in the database. Yeah, so he can manually add you to the Moodle course without you being registered onto online. All right, any more questions so far? Yes? Like, could you speak up a little? I'm having a hard time understanding you. Uh-huh. So the question is what courses belong to this interdisciplinary courses? Uh, so usually there is, uh, let's say, two or three kinds of courses that can be used there. Um, first, what many students do is they do a language course. And all language courses are always interdisciplinary courses. Uh, one thing to watch out for is if you do a beginner's course, so a A11 level course for any language, uh, you can use that for at most three credits even if the module is worth more, right? So you can't cover all four credits with just one beginner's level course in any language. Um, and of course, uh, you can't do a language course and have it a credit for in your mother tongue. So usually the German speaking students will not be able to take a German beginner's course. People have tried that. <laughs> um, then there's also soft skills courses, very different kinds like uh, project management, for example. Um, or public speaking. Um, many of those courses are offered by uh, our institution, Karl von Linde Academy, um, also by Polere and many, many other institutes at TUM and some also outside of TUM. Um, there's a large selection of those courses and they should at some point be available at TUM Online. Probably they are not visible yet, right? <laughs> you know, okay, me, yeah, me neither. <laughs> So I'm guessing they will be made visible uh, hopefully next week. Um, and then especially for the Math Masters program, in the Math Masters, you can do courses in your minor. So meaning you can do uh, courses that are basically an application of mathematics, like for example, some physics courses or engineering courses or computer science courses. Um, you can basically select whatever courses you want from the curriculum for that minor. Uh, but you don't have to. You can do without any minor as well in the math program. Um, and the regulation here is uh, you can also do one of those minor courses as an interdisciplinary course if you don't use a minor course from the same section as minor, right? So for example, if you do computer science courses at your minor, you can't do computer science at, as, as interdisciplinary anymore, but you could do like chemistry if you want to do that. And I'll admit that's rarely done. So usually people do the soft skills courses and language courses for the interdisciplinary program. Yes. So you mean if you earn more than those 120 credits in total, what happens then? Yeah, um, and often people do more interdisciplinary courses than they have to. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so what happens if you earn more than 120 in total is um, 
we'll try to use the best modules that you have to complete those at least 120 credits. Of course, you'll also have to make sure that all the specific requirements for your program are fulfilled, so you can't choose freely, usually. Um, and then all the other courses that are not necessary to complete the 120 credits will be moved to additional achievements. That means they will also be listed on an extra page in your curriculum, but they don't enter the grade computation. Um, usually that does not get you exactly 120 credits, but often a little more. Um, and in that case, the actual credits are used for the, uh, for the computation of your degree. Right? So that's a weighted average of your individual grade stand. Does that answer the question? Okay, let's move on to exams then. Here we go, oops. Back. Okay, exams. So the uh, most common form of examination that you'll encounter here at TUM is the written exam in a limited time. Limited time usually means something like 60 or 90 minutes, depending on the course, depending on the exam. Um, so it's not too much time here. You may be used, depending on where you study first, you may be used to uh, longer time slots. Um, and often our courses are pretty large, so uh, for most courses, that written examination is uh, the norm. In the master's program, you'll also encounter smaller courses, especially in the later semesters when you do more specialized things. And in that case, the examiners may also choose to offer oral exams instead of written exams. Usually, um, that choice is at the discretion of the examiner. And he or she will announce that choice, hopefully, in the beginning of the semester. Um, occasionally, there's also other things um, like presentations, uh, like homework, very rarely homework, uh, like project work in some specific courses that are basically made to do project work. Uh, that also happens, uh, but the norm is normal written exams or oral exams. Um, that's what we usually do. The examinations um, usually happen right after the lecture period ends. So for this lecture period, which ends, I think, uh, February 11th or 10th or so, uh, exams start on February 13th. So that's the first lecture free week. Um, and they extend for about three weeks usually. So this semester until March 4th. Then, at least for the math department, um, retakes will be offered. So in case you couldn't attend the first attempt or for whatever reason you failed the first attempt, uh, you can do a retake. And that is usually offered uh, at the end of the semester break, sometimes into the first week of lectures as well. Um, for the examinations after this semester, the retake period will be April 3rd to April 15th. So that's usually a little shorter uh, because hopefully not that many people will have to attend retakes. So scheduling becomes a little easier. You can, of course, only do retakes uh, if you have not passed an exam already. So you can't get a better grade by doing the retake, unless you failed, of course. Um, and there is no obligation to actually register and attend the first exam if you want to do the retake. So you can also choose to just do the retake. Uh, in that case, of course, you basically you forfeit your second attempt. You only have one attempt then, um, but that's a possibility. You can do that. Um, please be sure to check if you do exams with departments other than math, they might have different regulations. Both for the uh, examination periods, they may be different. Um, and also for the retakes. So for some departments, retakes may not be offered at all. Some computer science courses do that, for example. Um, or retakes may be offered in a different rhythm. So. Um, what we do is we offer retakes at the end of the same examination period. Other departments offer the retakes each semester. So there's one examination now and one in half a year. That's on the retake. So be sure to check that if you depend on a specific examination and a specific semester. Yeah. 
I don't, so the examination period is mostly the same, but I don't know exactly for the computer science department. Mostly, yeah, it should be mostly the same. Maybe a few days difference. So if you want to do an exam, I mentioned already, you don't have to register for the course on TUM online, but you do have to register for the exam if you want to take it. So prior exam registration is strictly required to take an exam. The registration period this semester starts uh, on November 21st, so usually it starts around mid-November somewhere, uh, and the end is January 15th. And again, usually the registration period ends about a month before lectures end. There is a separate uh, registration for the retake, so if you want to do the retake, Regardless of whether you registered for the first attempt or not, you have to register for the retake again. There is no automatic registration. Okay, um, the dates are always posted on our website, so you can look it up there. And as the question uh, is asked very often, the final transcript that you get at the end will only contain past exams. Of course, in your Tomorrowland account, you'll also be able to uh, review the exams that you failed or didn't attend. So they will show up there, but they will not show up on your final transcript. So only credits that you actually earned will be listed there. Recognitions. So maybe some of you have already done um, a course in anticipation of your master's program that you then didn't use for the bachelor's program, but want to transfer to the master's. Maybe some of you will go abroad and do courses there. Um, and of course, you will be able to use, maybe not all, but many of the credits you earn there as well towards your program, if you plan carefully. Um, and basically, there's two options to do those recognitions, um, just to give you a basic understanding of that. There's what we call a one-to-one -one recognition. That means if you find a TUM course that is basically the same as the one that you already took, you can apply for this one-to-one -one recognition. Um, and then the other course will count in place of the TUM course, meaning you can't do the TUM exam anymore, uh, but the course will show up as if you did that. So in particular, it counts in the same section as the TUM course. Um, and then there's also what we call other universities register uh, recognitions. So that means if you can't find a course at TUM that mostly does the same things, but you still think the course would be a valid addition to your program, um, we may be able to register it, uh, to recognize it as well towards your program. Um, in that case, it's probably best to just come talk to us um, or also to Angela Puchat, um, who will also give you advice on your course choice when you want to go abroad um, and give you ideas of what may be recognized here and what may not be such a good idea. Um, one thing that I should mention is you can't use courses that you've already used towards your bachelor degree for the master's again, yeah? So there's no double use. Those courses have to be separate, meaning you, even if you did them during your bachelor's but didn't use them, you could transfer them to the master's. But if they entered the grade in the bachelor's, you can't use them again. Um, there's one exception to that rule, and that is if you did a four-year bachelor program, because we usually do three-year bachelor programs here, so the idea is to do three years bachelor, two years master's. If you did four years um, in your bachelor program, then you can use courses that are specifically um, designed for the last year of your bachelor's program. So basically, we count that towards the master's already. Again, if you have any questions there, any details, um, just come to our consultation hours and we'll have a look at the details, see what we can do. Okay, questions about exams before we go on. Yes. Okay, so the question is uh, the regulations for the different departments, where can you find that information? Uh, usually the best way is to just ask the examiner. He should know or she should know. Um, and often you'll also find that information on the websites of the departments. Just try to look them up there. And again, if you're not sure, ask us and we should be able to find out. 
And the questions on examinations? Yes. I didn't understand the first one. We're talking about free registration courses? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so maybe that's two questions. Um, if you, when you register for an exam, you'll have the option to choose how to count that exam to watch your program. Um, in some cases, there are different sections where a course can be used, and then you can choose which section you want that course in. Uh, or you could always choose free registration as well, meaning the course will not enter any section just yet. Um, if you do that, and then later decide you want to, count, uh, to have that course counted in a specific section, let us know, and we'll be able to change that selection for you. Um, or, of course, you can also do courses uh, that are not part of your degree program, that you just want to do because you're interested in specific topics, even if they're not, um, they can't be used for credits in your program. You can register for those, again, as a free registration, do the exam, um, and those would then show up as additional achievements on your final transcript. So they don't enter the grade, they don't enter the required credits, but they'll be on this additional achievements page. So let me let me say that again. Um, once you pass an exam, you can't take it anymore. Yeah. So there, you can't uh, get a better grade by going to the retake if you have passed the first attempt already. If you feel um, that maybe you're you're sitting in the exam and you feel that's not everything that you could do and you could earn a better grade next time, uh, then make sure to cancel everything that you have written before you submit the exam to make sure you actually fail. But of course, that's a gamble, right? <laughs> Here's one question. So the question is, uh, are there no third chances? Uh, the answer is yes, of course. Um, provided that A, the course is actually offered again. So some courses are only offered once and then there's only this one chance at examination, one semester. But if the course is offered on a regular basis, then of course you can just go when the course is offered again and then redo the exams, yeah? So there's no count of attempts here. Can Theoretically, you can do an exam as often as you like, provided uh, you fulfill all the other requirements. I'll talk about those in a few minutes. Yes. So the question is, uh, is there also a deregistration period if you choose you don't want to go to a, a specific exam after all? Uh, the answer is yes. You can always deregister up to one week before the examination date. So one week before examination date, uh, deregistration is closed. So if in doubt, register for exam, and then up to one week before the exam date, you can always make up your mind and then deregister. And of course, it would be nice to actually do so if you choose not to go to the exam, uh, because that means the exam organizer will have to print fewer exams. Maybe we'll need fewer supervisors. Um, if many people do that, we may be able to do without one lecture hall. Uh, and of course, that all saves resources and people's time. So it would be nice if you actually deregistered if you know you don't want to come to an exam. Yes. Okay, so the question is if you registered for an exam but didn't pass, is it necessary to pass at some point? And the answer is no. Yeah. So if you register for an exam and don't go or fail the exam, then there is no obligation attached to that. Apart, of course, from those two compulsory modules in data science, you have to pass that at some time. 
Okay, let's go on. Um, some more specific modules that I want to talk about, because they are different from all the rest. I've mentioned most of those already. One is the internship. I already said, uh, what you do in your internship is um, you pursue an activity outside of research and outside of the university setting. So working at some other research institution or as a working student here in the math department does not count as an internship usually. All right, so we want you to go out and experience something different. Uh, the uh, internship takes at least four weeks, six weeks for data science, but of course you can do more and usually you will do more. Um, and that's also because many companies um, are willing to pay pretty good money for good students. Um, so usually you will be interested in working some time. After you completed this compulsory internship, uh, you give a report at the internship seminar. And as another obligation, you also give feedback on reports of other students all the details on how this works and when you can do what and what the deadlines for, for registrations for your talks or submissions for um, feedback reports are. All those details can be found on this web page here. There's also an email address there. If in doubt, just ask. Um, and of course, the same is true for the internship that you do. Basically, we want you to do something that is more or less typical for what mathematicians do after they studied. Um, that's a bit vague, so if you're not sure if your internship counts, um, then again, just ask. Write an email to the people listed on the website, give a few details on what you're planning to do, and they'll be able to say that counts or it doesn't count. For data science, um, there's one specialty here. So if you're studying math and data science, you can, instead of the internship, uh, you can do the course because it's called Data Innovation Lab. That's basically a course where you work together with a research institution or a company, um, work for one semester in a little team on an applied project. And that also earns you 10 credits and can be used to replace the internship. Okay, so you can do that or that. Question. Yes, yeah, so you, you, we want you to work somewhere in the industry to at least for once experience how that is, <laughs> working outside of research, even if you want to do poor math for the rest of your life, um, that's of course fine, but still we want you to go out for once, four weeks, uh, and get an idea of what real life is, so to say. And maybe you're getting hooked then. <laughs> yes. So the question is, does it have to be a full-time job? Um, the answer is no. You can also do this on a part-time basis, or you can, like uh, many students also do, like one day a week or something like that, uh, as long as you accumulate sufficiently many hours. Yeah, so basically uh, we're calculating four weeks times, I think, 35 hours or 36 hours, something like that. Um, again, rule of thumb. Ask there if you want to know the details, but as long as you accumulate basically as many hours as you would do in a four weeks full-time job, you're good. All right, so that was the internship. The seminar, I've mentioned that you do uh, one seminar during the course of your master's program. Um, of course, as the question also gets asked often, you can do more than one seminar, but only one seminar will count for credits. The other would then be an additional achievement if you want to do that. Most people do the seminar in the third semester, but there is no strict regulation for that. Uh, the reason is that often the seminar is kind of a preparation, a start for your master's thesis. So as part of the seminar, um, you do some research into a very specific topic, and that, of course, often gives you a good starting point for then doing a thesis in that specific field. 
that's not a strict requirement, so you don't have to do your thesis based on a seminar, but it's usually a good idea to do that. Um, for some chairs, there is a certain number of requirements if you want to do a master's thesis with them. So some chairs require that you did um, a seminar with them before you can apply for a master's thesis. So that is something that is um, specific for those chairs and not a general regulation. So if in doubt, again, just ask the professors that you want to work with in your thesis or in your seminar. For seminars, the application is usually at the end of the previous semester. So the application period for seminars in this semester is already over. At the end of the semester, um, we post a list of seminars for next semester, and then the application phase will start. Um, and we'll hopefully be using our matching system for that application phase. That means uh, the information on the seminars will be available on that website here. And you can then choose which seminars you'd like to do um, and uh, provide a list to the system of what seminar you'd preferably do and what may be your second choice or your third choice, your fourth choice. Rank as many seminars as you want. Um, and the system will then try to assign all the students to hopefully seminars that are high up in their list. Okay, so that's the idea of the matching system. And of course, um, the uh, uh, the lecturers who actually do the seminars do also get a say in whether they want to take you or not. Yes. Sorry? I still, I didn't get a question, sorry. <laughs> For this semester. Seminar. A free choice, meaning uh, where well, you can choose among the seminars that are offered, of course. You're supposed to take part in a seminar. Yes. Yes. The question is, can you do the seminar while you're abroad? Uh, usually no. no. That's usually that's not an option. So if you're abroad for three weeks at the beginning of a semester and then you want to join a seminar or at the end of the semester or in the middle of the semester. So if for whatever reason you are away from Garching or from Munich um, for an extended period of time during any time of a semester and want to take part in a class like a seminar where you usually have to be present, uh, just talk to the seminar lecturer. Ideally before you register for the seminar uh, and he or she will then tell you if that can be arranged or not. Some, some seminars are done uh, on a weekly basis throughout the semester. Some seminars are done on like, uh, you meet a few days at the beginning or at the end of the semester, or maybe both. Um, in many cases, something like that can be arranged for if you don't leave for the whole semester. Yeah, but just ask. Right, I've talked about interdisciplinary courses already, so not much I'll have to add there. I already said, usually it's language courses, soft skills courses, uh, and you need at least four credits in those. Um, and for data science, please be sure to watch out for, you need three credits for social and political aspects of data science. There's a specific catalog of interdisciplinary modules that fall into that category. So be sure to take enough courses from that category to complete your program. Um, one final specific course or kind of courses that we also offer um, are the case studies courses. So there's a number of case studies courses. We offer case studies in discrete optimization, in nonlinear optimization, um, in science and engineering, uh, and also in biomathematics, sometimes also in finance. In those courses, um, the idea is usually working on a real life project. So you don't learn that much theory, but instead um, the focus is on hands-on problem solving. 
you usually work in a small team of three to five people, depending on the specific course. Um, and the idea is to apply what you have learned in prior more theory focused courses to real life problems. And also in the course of time, learn something about teamwork, learn something about presentation, um, gain a number of valuable skills that way. The number of participants for those courses is usually very limited. Um, so we require registration for those. And that registration usually happens way before the semester starts. Um, usually also at the end of the previous semester. So if you want to take part in one of those courses, uh, be sure to watch out for announcements. Usually um, we do an info session at the end of the previous semester where we give you all the details, um, ideas about the projects we're going to do, um, and then also ask you to register by a certain date. Um, and when date has passed, we'll select the participants of those courses. The case studies optimization courses are usually taking place in summer. Uh, science engineering is usually taking place in winter, I think, but uh, yeah, as far as I know. Uh, Biomath and finance are on a more regular basis. So if you're interested in one of those and don't know when they will take place, uh, just ask the respective lecturers about that. Or if you're not sure who that is, just ask us. Yes. So for the registration, that's usually some kind of a matching system um, where the uh, lecturers choose the participants based on several criteria. So usually we ask what courses you did. And we have a certain number of courses that we require. We have a certain number of courses that might be, might be, might be beneficial for, for certain projects. Of course, we ask what projects you would be interested in, if you'd like to work with certain people, what programming skills you might have, things like that. Uh, and based on that, um, lecturers then choose the people that they want for their courses. Uh, so the case studies, um, the question is which of the blocks do the case studies belong to? And the question is, uh, the answer is that depends on your program. <laughs> You'll have to look that up in the examination regulations or into them online. Just look at the course catalog and see where you find the case studies courses. So what's the recommendation for the semester for the case studies courses? Uh, that depends a little on your prior knowledge, because usually you, you need to do some theory courses before you can do the case studies courses. Um, so I'd say maybe the second or third semester would be ideal for the case studies courses, depending on when they are offered, of course. Right. Finally, master's thesis. Um, I already said the thesis is usually done during your last semester. It's not a strict requirement, but for very good reasons, most people do it that way. Um, you work in six months full-time on a thesis, it's worth 30 credits, so um, expect to work for one complete semester, doing nothing or at least not much besides the thesis. Um, for doing a thesis, you'll need to find a supervisor from the TUM math department. One exception for data science, um, computer science supervisors also work but they have to be approved by your uh, academic advisor, by Peter Masopost. So if in doubt, just ask him. Um, for all the others, it has to be someone from the TUM math department. Of course, it is fine to do corporations, um, and we've done that in many cases. So for example, if you're studying uh, mathematical finance, um, you might also be able to find a thesis from the uh, Chum Business School if you can find a supervisor from the math department who's willing to sign up on that, yeah? And that supervisor will officially be the one who is responsible for the thesis. So he'll be the one or she'll be the one giving the grade um, and signing the registration form. And basically the same is true um, for a thesis that you want to do in cooperation with the industry. We've done that as well in the past. Um, and again, you're free to do that, but you need to find a supervisor here at the math department who's willing to cooperate. And again, that supervisor will be the one giving the rate, not the firm that you work for. A 
Okay, questions on that? Yes. So for the data innovation app and the internship, I think you can do both, right? In, in, yeah. I was, I was thinking of the wrong program. So you can do, you can do more than one case studies course, um, but usually not in the same semester. Yes, you can do case studies, yes. Any other questions so far? All right, last section of this talk. Now we've talked about all the good things, let's talk about all the dangerous things as well. Things that better not go wrong during your studies, but that you should be aware of. I've mentioned prerequisites already. So with your admission letter, you might have received one or two prerequisite courses. I'll show you in just a minute how you would find that out. Um, if a prerequisite is mentioned on your admission letter, then that means you must pass that course within your first year. And that's meant very strictly. It's uh, so the, the first year, starts on October 1st for you and ends on September 30th, 23. So the exam must be passed until that date. Remember that most courses here at the math department are only offered once a year. So that means you'll usually have two attempts. One first attempt, one second attempt, and that's it. Extensions for prerequisites, for whatever reason, are impossible. So that's something that should absolutely have priority if you have prerequisites. And also the credits, I mentioned that already, the credits do not count towards your program. Basically that's something that you need for the admission, um, but that can't be used for the program. Now, because in case you fail these prerequisites, it might be a good idea to have a backup plan in hand. And one possible backup plan would be to apply for a different master's program. So that in case you fail the prerequisites and would then be exmatriculated from your current program, you can still stay here, study in another program. Um, often, well, if you have a prerequisite, um, you will usually be in one of our more specialized programs. So mathematical finance, um, operations research, that's basically it. I don't think the others give prerequisites. Um, so you can apply for one of the other programs. Of course, you'll have to watch out for the deadlines for this application. Many people do apply for the math masters, for example, as a backup plan. Um, and then if they pass the prerequisites, it's all good and they just stay in their program and they decline the place in, in math. Um, if for whatever reason they fail the prerequisite, they can still continue studying at least the math masters and then reuse most of the courses that they already successfully passed. Um, and that's especially true in case uh, the prerequisites that you have to take are offered in your second semester, right? So if you do those prerequisites now in the winter semester, you'll know by the end of the first semester if you pass them or not. And basically you have your second semester to think about what you wanna do with the rest of your study program. Um, if the prerequisites examinations only happen at the end of the next summer semester, that means all the deadlines for applications for the programs will be long past when you know the results. So maybe you want to put in an application just in case. All right, how to find out if you have prerequisites? Um, your application letter should look something like what you see here. And that's a German version here. Um, in case you have prerequisites, it will contain a sentence like the last one here, diese Zulassung gilt vorbehaltlich der Erfüllung von folgenden Auflagen. And then there would be a list of prerequisites. Yeah? In this case, it's MA2409 probability theory, meaning you have to pass that module in the first year. 
Yeah, for the English version, it reads like this. The admission is only valid if the following requirements are fulfilled, and then again, a list of prerequisites. Okay, so if you're not sure, check that admission letter, and if you're unsure what it says, don't hesitate to ask us. All right, so that applies if you have prerequisites. Most of you probably won't have any. Now, the next uh, things apply for everybody. Basically, there's, let's say, two kinds of hurdles for your master's program, two things that you must watch out for. The first should be easy, hopefully. That's what I call fundamental modules here. Um, and that means for all of your programs, there is one section in the regulations, that's uh, Article 38. So you could look that up in the official legal documents, Article 38. Um, that says within the first two semesters, you need to pass at least one course in one of a list of sections. Yeah? For example, for the math master's program, um, it says you need to pass at least one math module in the first year. And that should be doable. Um, for other courses, that choice is a little more restricted. For the finance master, I think it's one module in uh, either mathematical finance or actual science. And similar for the other programs. Yeah, Basically, one module that is somehow in the core of that program. And if you don't manage that after one year, you maybe you should rethink your study program choice. Uh, so that's something that hopefully you will all be able to do. <clears throat> okay, so that's uh, an example for this Article 38. Um, and here you see that will contain something like uh, this uh, sentence 2 here. Mindestens eine, denn Anlage 1 aufgeführt mit Rudolf in Austin Abschnitten A11, 1, 2, A3, muss und so weiter. Yeah, so that will tell you which sections are relevant for these fundamental modules. And this uh, Anlage 1, um, Appendix 1, that is uh, that contains the list of modules, the Kolsch-Kolleg, Kadolak, basically. So the second one, the second attempt is, uh, sorry, second hurdle is probably more relevant. That is what we call study progress monitoring. And the idea is the following. So I already said, you're expected to complete about 30 credits per semester. So that means if you have a normal study program, you would earn 30 credits in the first semester. Then by the end of the second, you would have 60, then 90, and after the uh, fourth semester, you complete your thesis, earn 120 credits, and that means you complete your program. Now, again, that is basically uh, what we expect you to do, but it's not a strict requirement. The strict requirement is basically a shifted version, a translated version of that. So the strict requirement starts in the third semester, and that says by the end of the third semester, you need to have at least 30 credits in modules that count towards your degree program, of course, yeah? And then by the end of the fourth semester, you need at least 60 credits. And now it extends into the fifth semester. By the end of the fifth semester, you need at least 90 credits. And by the end of semester six, you need at least 120 credits. And that means, theoretically, you have up to six semesters to finish your study program if you are within this progress here. Yeah, that means if you usually do around 30 credits per semester from the first semester on, you won't get in trouble. If you decide to take a break for two semesters anyway, you might get in trouble. If you decide to take a break for three semesters, you will be in trouble. Okay, and uh, if you fail the study progress monitoring, um, that means your study program will be terminated forever without any possibility to come back. Yeah, so there's no thing like uh, counting attempts of exams here, but this is the strict requirement that you need to fulfill. And again, if for some reason um, you feel you're having trouble to fulfill that, please make sure to talk to us as early as possible. The earlier we know there might be problems and the earlier we know about the reasons and there are valid reasons for getting into trouble here, for example, extended illness, um, we can try to do something about that. 
And if you have valid reasons beyond your control, then of course there are ways to circumvent that. All right, so um, advisory and counseling. So if you feel you're getting in trouble with your study progress or with any other requirements of your study program, then please don't hesitate to come talk to us or anyone else who can help you there. And I try to compile the list of uh, possible um, places or people that you can ask for help here. Of course, your academic advisors would be um, a good first attempt, specifically if you struggle with course choice. Yeah, or if you struggle with the specific requirements of your study program, then try to talk to your academic advisors. If it's more about general problems, general academic regulations, then you're welcome to come talk to us. Uh, TUM also offers academic coaching and support that's independent of the department. Um, Apart from counseling, uh, they also offer a number of courses designed to uh, help you monitor your study progress, designed to help you learn and prepare for examinations correctly. Uh, you can have a look at that webpage and see what they currently offer there. And then there's also the uh, Munich Student Union. So the Student Union is basically responsible for all students that study in and around Munich, not just the TUM. Uh, and this is uh, an institution that's completely independent of TUM. So we will never know when you go there. We'll also never know when you go to TUM academic uh, coaching, just in case you're suspicious of that. Uh, the student union is completely independent of the university. And they also offer a lot of advisory services and counseling services. So if you feel you need help, that's always a good address to turn to. Uh, and by the way, they also have um, advisory possibilities for like legal troubles or something like that, yeah? So if you're getting in any legal predicaments, um, you can always ask there. And of course, basically that's free, yeah? So you paid your student union fees already and that is included in that student union fees. I, can you repeat that? I didn't get that. You have a prerequisite, yeah? So if you have a prerequisite, again, you need to take the examination and pass the examination in uh, in that subject. Uh, when you do that, uh, will be governed by when the exams are offered. Yeah, so the courses are offered on a yearly basis usually. Some are offered in the winter, some are offered in the summer, so it depends on um, the course that you have. Probability theory, that's probably, for most of you, that will be the prerequisite. That's offered in winter semester. Yeah, integer optimization for, for the OR people. Maybe you got integer optimization as a prerequisite. Um, that will be offered in winter as well. So those are usually the most interesting ones. Oh, okay. So if you have a prerequisite and you need to take that, uh, then my advice would be to reduce the number of credits for other courses a little. Yeah, be sure to to make this prerequisite your priority number one. All the other courses will be useless if you fail that. Yeah, so rather take not take too many other courses, but do concentrate on the prerequisite and maybe a few other courses on the side. But you don't have to do the full thirty credits. Okay, uh, one more thing that I have here. Uh, TUM also offers psychological counseling. So if you feel you need help, if you feel you need someone to talk to, um, again, there's people that you can talk to. Um, and on this website, there's a list of not only TUM people, um, but also other places that you can call. Um, go to consolation hours, um, talk to, get advice on who to talk to, um, get maybe a list of doctors if you need any help beyond that. So have a look at that if you feel um, you're in trouble and you need someone to talk to. Yes. Yes. Prerequisites are only mandatory if they show up in your admission letter, yeah? So uh, in the module handbook, many courses also list something, I think they also call it prerequisites. 
Uh, but that means you should have the knowledge in those courses, but there's no strict requirement of taking any examinations, yeah? The course will need those knowledge, uh, the knowledge usually conferred in, in uh, these modules, um, but it's not being tested anywhere. Yes. 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 Depending on when you start. So the question is basically how, how long does the thesis take and when will you, will you be done with that? So basically, uh, the thesis is not strictly bound to the semester. So you can start a thesis almost whenever you want. Uh, registration is always possible on the 1st and on the 15th of every month. Yeah, so every two weeks. And from that point on, you have six months to complete the thesis. Yeah, that's the way it works. You register and then the counter starts. Okay, so that basically concludes this presentation here. Any more questions so far? I have a few more words to say after that. So maybe so the the detailed questions about these course calcs, maybe we can discuss that right after the presentation. So we can pull up the reg the, the examination regulations and have a look at that. It's probably easiest. Any general questions? Yes. So the list of courses on Tom Online by this point should be mostly complete. Yeah, <laughs> there's always some last minute additions. So maybe there will be some more specialized courses coming in the course of this week or maybe even the course of next week. Uh, but most of the courses should be on Tom Online already. Some lecturers need more time than others. Uh, so the question is, are courses being recorded in the math department? And the answer is that depends a lot on the lecturer. Some lecturers do record their courses on a regular basis. Uh, some decline to do that. So you'd have to ask the lecturers. Right. Some words on... Uh, Further information, I'll start with the uh, international term. Let's see if I can find those slides. The international office asked me to also give you a few details here and uh, just open that. Uh, here. All right, so first a word uh, for all of our international students. I've said before um, that we would support all of you if you want to go abroad. And of course, we're happy if you go abroad and uh, get new and exciting experience, listen to interesting courses there that we may not be able to offer here at TUM. Um, a word of advice for the international students. Basically, your foreign experience, your study abroad experience is happening here in Germany. Um, and the, uh, let's say we've, we've seen that it's, not often, it's often not easy to adapt to the academic system here in Germany and at TUM. So my advice would be to take some time to adjust to this system. Be sure 
that you can actually do the courses that you require to do. Be sure that you earn enough credits. Of course, sign up for German language courses, learn about the culture and the people um, in Germany and get in contact with your fellow students here. Preferably do your internship with the company here in Germany to also uh, get a glimpse of German working culture. Um, and collect a few credits before you actually apply for a semester abroad. If you still want to go to some other country during your study program, of course, we will support you. Uh, but for an application, it's usually required to have an academic record here at TUM, or at least at a European university. Um, so my advice would be to study for one or two semesters before you put in an application for a semester abroad. If you've already done your bachelor's here or in Germany or somewhere in Europe, maybe um, somewhere where the system is at least similar to the one we have here, then there might also be a chance to apply with the program, the degree program that you already have. Uh, but that depends a lot on the specific requirements of the foreign university and of the program that you did. So again, it's usually a good idea to acquire at least one normal semester of credits here at TUM before you put in an application for a semester abroad. Um, for the international degree students, there is also an option that is maybe especially of interest for those, um, and that's the Athens program. Athens is, um, I think, a European program um, that offers research programs that are limited to one, often one week or sometimes two weeks. So you get to spend a week or two weeks at some university abroad. You get to participate in research. You're getting to take a very special course there, um, often a highly focused and highly interesting course. And of course, it also connects you with the foreign culture. Um, it's not as long as spending a semester abroad, but it's a good chance to experience the culture in some other European countries if you want to do that. That's at least a good first step. Um, and of course, you can also do your internship abroad. You don't have to do that at a German company, also we recommend that. But you can also do that at some other European company if you prefer to do that. Um, and again, you don't have to do just four weeks. You can also do a longer internship if you want to stay for a little longer. Um, if you want to spend one or two semesters abroad, there's a number of programs that you can apply for. I mentioned Erasmus already. We also have a, a TUM exchange, so that's a TUM specific exchange program. Um, for some of the programs, uh, we offer joint degrees or double degree programs. You can often do your master's thesis abroad. Again, you need to find a supervisor here at TUM, but we've done that numerous times already. I mentioned research stays, internships. Um, I mentioned Athens program. And of course, you can also choose to complete your master's first, and then do a PhD somewhere else. Um, usually, if you want to go abroad, application and preparation needs a lot of time. So be sure to plan for that stay abroad pretty early in your study program. Depending on where you want to go and depending on what you bring to the table, um, it might take a year or maybe even longer, up to 1.5 years before departure uh, that you need to start planning for your um, stay. So here's a couple of deadlines for this semester. If you uh, are planning to, to go abroad pretty soon, you should know about those. Deadline for TUM exchange, applications to TUM exchange is uh, by the end of October already. And deadline for Erasmus is mid-January 23. Um, there will be information events for all of these programs and for the numerous partner universities that we have all over the world. Uh, an Erasmus Info event is being offered on the 9th of November, a TUM Exchange Info event for the non-European destinations took place in May, uh, the next application period. It's again planned in May 23. So if you want to do that, watch out uh, for announcements of that info session. Uh, TUM Language Center, well, I've mentioned already that many people take language courses. Language courses here are offered by TUM Language Center. They are, of course, free of charge for students of TUM. Um, and there's also, there might also be the possibility to earn a language certificate. They offer certain certificate programs as well. So if you need specific language certificates, ask there. 
they may already be able to offer that. Let's go there quickly. Um, I already talked about Carola Jumpertz and uh, Julia Zöllock. So if you want to go abroad, be sure to talk to Carola as early as possible. Visit one of the information events specific to where you want to go. Um, and then make an appointment with her to see what may be a good choice for you and uh, what documents you would need and what your, what your chances are of being accepted. So she'll be able to help you there. All right, that's it about the international programs. Back to my slides. That was the one, yeah. Okay, I also mentioned uh, that Alexei Min, the uh, student advisor for mathematical finance and actual science, unfortunately he can't join us today. Um, so he'll be offering another information session, session for the students of that specific program. So if you're studying math finance and actual science, that info session is going to take place on Friday, October 14th at 10 o'clock. Um, you can either choose to come visit him. So the info session is taking place in Geichenhochbrück, where his office is, in room 202011. The address is Parkling 11. I'll put that information on the Moodle info page as well. Um, or Alexei will also stream that session online via Zoom. So you can just use that Zoom link and password. And again, I'll put that on the Moodle info page so you don't have to write it down um, to join that session live. If you have any questions you want to ask us, we are usually available um, during our regular consultation hours. Currently, those are taking place uh, on Thursdays, starting at, help me out, 9.30, right? So we're currently starting at 9.30. Um, we're offering 45 minutes um, in-person consultation hours here. So 9.30 to 10.15 is in-person at Anya's office near the info point. Um, and then from 10.15 to 11, we're adding 30, 45 minutes of online consultation hours. So if you can make it in person, then you're welcome to join us on Zoom afterwards. Um, and we'll hopefully be able to help you with all your questions there. And of course, that's also true for all the international students who couldn't make it here today. You're welcome to join us during our consultation hour online. I'll put all of these slides and the links here on our Moodle info page. So that is maybe the link that you want to write down, this Moodle info page link, if you haven't registered for that course yet. Moodle is our e-learning platform, um, and we've added one course where we select, uh, where we collect all that information, and we will also post news about events, um, important deadlines, and things like that in the course of the semester. Um, you can choose which information is interesting for you and subscribe to the different fees that we offer there. So please make sure to register for that course. You should be able to just enroll yourself. Yeah, no turmoil registration required. Just go to that link that will redirect to the Moodle page. And you should be able to just click enroll and be part of that course. Yeah, and the slides will be available there. Good. So that concludes my info session here. Um, we will, of course, be available for questions afterwards. And I'd like to invite you to join us for a little, what, what did you call it? Meet and greet <laughs> with uh, Julia Zulok. Um And of course, with us and some of your study advisors, uh, I think Peter Massepust, more specifically, will be there. So if you have any specific questions, you're welcome to join us there. Um, Anya and myself will also be there, so you can ask any specific questions you want. And of course, there'll also be drinks and snacks um, and possibly cookies. So just join us outside in the hall. Uh, I think the tables that we reserved are by the trees in the back of the hall. So I'll hopefully see you there in a few minutes. And if you have any questions, you'll be able to discuss those there. <laughs>